like to start this morning by saying that uh, I must preach to you. I must. There's no option in that for me. As long as I am a pastor of Midland Baptist Church, I, I am obligated. I have a responsibility to preach to you the Word of God, but also realize in saying that that I get to preach to you. And I say that because I know it's a privilege. And I don't take that for granted, and I'm thankful that I'm allowed to stand before you and preach the Word of God on Sunday mornings. And I, I thank God for that, and I thank you for that. But with all of that said, with all of that said, I, I think one of the things that I might have been criticized the most for over my years as a pastor, and I think I'm in my ninth year now, uh, but uh, the thing probably I've been criticized for the most are my sermons concerning false believers, my sermons concerning uh, false disciples, people who profess to have faith in Jesus Christ, yet, uh, uh, yet we don't see evidence of salvation in their life. I think probably that's the greatest criticism that I've had because people really don't want their faith questioned. As a matter of fact, I had a lady tell me that once in a Sunday school class where and I, I was talking about some of this kind of stuff and she said, I don't like having my faith questioned. People, sometimes they, they come to a point where they've walked an aisle at some point in their life and they've said the prayer at some point in their life and maybe they got wet in baptism at some time in their life and they, they don't want their eternal security shaken so they don't want their, their faith questioned. But I tell you, you look in some people's life and we talked about some of them in Sunday school this morning, there's just no evidence no evidence of a changed life. There's no evidence of, uh, of regeneration. No evidence of being born again. No evidence that they have a desire to follow God. A, a desire to obey His commandments. There's no desire in their heart to, to worship. No desire to come to church. And I, I tell you, it concerns me because many of those people, they don't see a problem with that. They, they don't have any issue with that. They, they keep on walking. Right down that, uh, that broad road that they think is salvation, headed toward a wide gate that they think is leading them into heaven, and yet they're being led into destruction. They are deceived by a false faith. Deceived by a false belief. And I tell you, I'm not angry about My heart breaks for those people. My heart really is saddened uh, for those people. And I tell you, if by any means whatsoever within my power, I am able to take one of those souls and lead them down the difficult path that leads to the narrow gate, which is salvation, I'll do it. I'll do it. And this morning, we kind of have one of those kinds of messages. But Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, examine yourselves as whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? We need to constantly be looking into our own lives to determine whether or not we're truly walking in the faith that we claim to have. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you again for the opportunity to gather this morning. The ecclesia, as it says in the, uh, the Greek language, the gathering of the church together, Lord, we uh, we, we are humbled by the, the mere fact that we get to do something that many nations, many people don't get to do on a regular basis. Many, many people don't get to do uh, safely. Uh, I read these stories about Nigeria and, and Pakistan and China where people are losing their lives on a regular basis because of their faith in Jesus Christ where pastors are being held captive and, and, and they're being mutilated and their, <laughs> their heads are being taken from their body. We don't have to worry about that, but Lord, we do, uh, we do come here together and we're grateful for this opportunity. And Lord, let us worship you well. That's what we're here for this morning, to learn and to worship. So let us worship you in spirit and in truth, and let us uh, worship you in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, over my, my years in church, since my youth, I think I've known people who appear to be on fire for Jesus Christ. And I'm sure you've known the same kind of people. They, uh, they were on fire for Jesus Christ for a short time, but then, for whatever reason, their flames sputtered and eventually went out. I know we've known people who, uh, who came to church for a short amount of time and, and who left suddenly. 
I remember when we were at Cool Springs, I wasn't pastor then, I was doing some church music, we were at Cool Springs Missionary Baptist, and a lady came in one day, and she sat through a service, and man, she seemed to be on, she kept testifying about Jesus Christ, and talking about how much now she believed after hearing our pastor preach, and she came forward, and eventually she got baptized, and she joined the church very suddenly, and then she just disappeared. Never saw her again. No idea what even happened to her. The Bible tells us that faith does not fail. The Bible tells us that faith endures. Jesus himself said in Mark 13, verse 13, that he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now there are fewer things that I can think of that might be sadder than when a person just stops and quits on Jesus Christ. Than when a person just throws their hands up and walks away from the church. But I think we've all known people like that. It can be especially painful whenever that person is someone close to you. Might be a family member, might be a friend, might even be a spouse. I think those are probably the most painful. But we've all known people who have gotten up angry at church and thrown up their hands and just walked out the door and not come back. And I tell you, that can be a heart-wrenchingly painful. Regardless of the circumstance, we don't ever want to see anyone leave the church. We don't ever want to see anyone quit on Jesus. But also understand that's why there are verses in the Bible such as 1 John 2.19 that warns us. 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they were not. They went out uh, that they might uh, be made manifest that none of them were of us. There are many people who bail out on Jesus Christ. Many people who, who abandon the church. Now my question is, is that because they lost their faith? Is that because somehow they lost their salvation? And I tell you, the answer to that question is no. They didn't lose their saving faith. They didn't lose their salvation. They never had to begin with. Never had it. And I tell you, false believers should never be comfortable within the church. Even though there are many of them that should never be comfortable within the church. And I tell you why. It's because, it's because false belief, being a false disciple of Jesus Christ is damaging. It's devastating not only to the individual, it's also damaging to the church itself. Now think about that individual. <coughs> False faith, false belief doesn't save anyone. Those people who have a false form of faith in Jesus Christ, they're just as condemned to hell as a person that has no faith at all. So we don't do those folks any favors by allowing them to wallow in their false belief. The best way that we can love those folks is to gently try to guide them to true saving faith in Christ. As far as the church is concerned, whenever there are many false believers within the church, the church is weakened because our testimony becomes weakened. <clears throat> For that reason, there are many passages in Scripture that warn us uh, against their false belief and that help us identify false belief. And that's really what I want to touch on this morning is how to identify a false believer in Jesus Christ. We, as Christians, must be able to tell the difference between a real Christian and a false Christian, both for their sake, because we don't want them to perish, and for the sake of the church, because we don't want the church to be weakened. So as we move forward in our study of John chapter 6 this morning, I hope you'll gain knowledge in that. I hope you'll gain wisdom in that, but also I hope that you'll be moved by this. Because I tell you, this is a sad topic, and I really believe that here in the midst of chapter 6, we come to one of the saddest things that we read in all of Scripture. This, this issue, what's going on here, deals with false disciples who turn away from Jesus Christ and walk away. John 6, verse 66 says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And I tell you, that's sad. It's sad when the disciples of Jesus Christ don't walk with Him anymore. 
we hear that many of those disciples didn't follow Jesus anymore, but even, even more than that, I think we hear the sadness of Jesus Christ in the words that He uses here. And if Jesus is saddened, then we too should be saddened. We should be moved by what we hear. Jesus says in verse 67, He said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? There's a sadness in that. All this multitude of disciples have left Jesus Christ, and you can almost hear the sadness in His voice when He turns to His twelve disciples, His closest followers, and says, Do you want to go away too? There's a deep sadness in what we hear here. We need to be moved by that. Jesus had had compassion. Compassion on the sick. Compassion on the disease. He'd been healing them by uh, the thousands. I don't think there was a small number of people that Jesus healed during this time. There were many. And because of that, He had drawn a crowd. There was a multitude that were following Him. And Jesus had miraculously fed that we talked about that just last Sunday, I believe. Fed that group, 5,000 men plus women and children. He was doing miracle after miracle after miracle, and they were disciples. They were following him, yet they turned away. They walked with him no more. They went, they left. This chapter really shows us the character, the nature of a false disciple of Jesus Christ. And I tell you, that's a huge issue within the church today. There are still false disciples in the church today that are professing faith in Jesus Christ. And we have to be aware of that. Otherwise, there are going to be condemned souls sitting in pews. And again, the church's testimony will be strengthened by that. There's 71 verses in this chapter. They really, from beginning to end, cover this particular topic. And I really believe it's unwise for us to assume that just because a person says the right thing, that they talk about Jesus Christ, that that means they are indeed a saved believer in Christ. I think verse 66 makes it very clear to us, a very simple statement there. From that time, many of his disciples went back and followed him no more. Disciples. Disciples, that, that's the word that's used there. And I think we get sometimes confused about what it means to be a disciple. Because often in our, our minds we think that when someone is a disciple, that means they're a true believer in Jesus Christ. Yet this tells us some of these, many of these disciples, they walked away. Now that word disciples in the original Greek language comes from a, a, a Greek word called mathete. And the Greek word mathete, it means a, a follower. It means a, a learner. It means a student. It doesn't mean a believer. It doesn't mean someone who is saved. It simply means someone who is following after someone else, trying to learn something from them, trying to, trying to gain something from them. The rabbis of that day, the rabbis of the, of the Jewish, ancient Jewish culture that day, they all had disciples. They all had people who followed them and who uh, thought of them as being their teacher. We're even told in Scripture that John the Baptist had his own disciples. So don't get confused with the idea of disciples when you hear it, that that automatically means that a person has come to save your faith. Understand that Jesus, above all teachers across all time, never had more disciples. Uh, I mean, had more disciples than any other teacher who had ever come before him. The multitude of, of disciples that Jesus had surpassed any, any group of disciples that had ever existed before in human history. Yet many of those disciples were false. They turned their back on Jesus and walked away. To understand, some disciples are real Christians and some disciples are false Christians. And we need to be able to tell the difference. And, and we'll start with this. False Disciples always follow the crowd. They're attracted uh, to the crowd. They're not attracted to worship. They're not attracted to the Word of God. They're not attracted to the teaching or the preaching. They're not attracted even to godly fellowship with other Christians. They are simply attracted to the crowd. I understand this multitude started as a small group. 
And then people heard about what Jesus was doing, and more people joined the crowd, and more people joined the crowd, and the crowd kept growing and growing until finally in verse 2 of chapter 6, a great multitude followed him. People are drawn to what is popular. Popular people draw a crowd, and Jesus had become popular, and he was drawing a crowd. What was it about Jesus that drew this large crowd? Well, he had been healing. He had been healing people by, uh, in multitudes. Matthew 4, verse 24 says, Then his fame went throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptic, and paralytic, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Matthew 15, verse 30 says, Great multitudes came to him, having with them lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. So this multitude was drawn to Jesus because he had become famous, a celebrity kind of a figure in their day. But understand, false believers are also drawn to the supernatural. They're drawn to what they see as being miraculous. People today are still drawn to churches where, where the preachers stand in the pulpits and promise them miracles. Promise them faith healings and that sort of thing. Promise them that they're going to be able to speak in tongues and do miraculous things. They're promised miracles. They're promised supernatural power. And they're drawn to that. False believers, false disciples, they're, they're interested in the earthly benefits of believing in Jesus Christ, but these false disciples, they have little interest in the heavenly benefits of following Jesus Christ. False disciples want Jesus to give them what they want when they want it. That's a false, that's a false disciple. And I think that's what we see going on here in these scriptures as we come to verse 16. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. So Jesus had fed the multitude. He fed the 5,000 plus the, the women and children. And now evening had come, and Jesus' 12 disciples, that's the disciples mentioned there, they go down and they get in the same boat that Jesus had come with them in when they came across the Sea of Galilee. Remember we said they crossed over, they went to a deserted place. And now here they are, the twelve disciples are getting back in the same boat that they came in. And they're headed back to a place called Capernaum. They're going back across the sea, they're headed to Capernaum. By this time, Capernaum had kind of become Jesus' base of operation, so they, they were headed back to Capernaum. Why did they do that? Well, Jesus had told them, Matthew telling this same story in his gospel says in uh, chapter 14, verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now Mark tells us that they, they made a little side trip. They took an excursion on their cruise, <laughs> went to a place called Bethsaida. So they left, they were on their way to, uh, to Capernaum, but they went to a little place called Bethsaida, and there they waited. They figure, well, Jesus is going to meet up with us somewhere. Here's a good place to wait for him. They probably expected Jesus to come walking around the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee and get in their boat and join them there. But Jesus didn't come. John tells us in verse 17, it was already dark. Jesus had not come to them. So they shoved off from there, and again they started heading toward Capernaum. But I understand by this time it was night. It was dark. Now that sounds kind, of, sounds kind of dangerous to me, but crossing the Sea of Galilee at night, but I'm thinking, well, Peter, James, John, Andrew, most of these guys were in that boat. They had been Galilean fishermen all of their lives. So they knew the waters. They understood the boats. They understood what was going on. I'm sure they had probably crossed the Sea of Galilee many times at night in their work. So this wasn't any big deal for them. I'm sure they had done it many times, but this time it's going to be a little bit different. 
First of all, verse 18 says, Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So right off the bat, they run into a squall. They run into a, a storm at sea. They get caught up in the wind. They get caught up in rough waves. And Scripture tells us they, they began to panic. They were, they, were, they were in fear. And we know this wasn't the first time this had happened to them. You might remember there was another story about a time these, this same group of disciples were out in a boat. Might even been the same one. And a storm rose up and water began to come over into the boat. And they were worried. Worried they were going to drown. Worried that they were going to sink. And Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat, wasn't he? So they go back. They wake him up. Say, Lord, don't you care that we perish? And Jesus went to the front of the, of the boat and he, he calmed the waves. Calmed the sea. Calmed the storm. And those disciples started saying, well, what, what kind of man is this? That was a different story. This is a, this is a completely different storm. Completely different situation. Verse 19 says, so when they had rowed about three or four miles, you hear that and think, well, hey, they're doing pretty good. Got this storm coming in and they've been rowing and they've been able to make three or four miles progress. That doesn't sound too bad when you're going into a headwind and you're, you're rolling a boat out at sea three or four miles. They're doing pretty good. But Matthew tells us that by this time it was six o'clock in the morning. Matthew calls it the fourth watch. So that means that these guys have been rowing all night. They rowed from, from night to, uh, till 6 o'clock in the morning. They've been rowing a long time to achieve that 3 or 4 miles. They weren't making such great progress. Matthew and Mark both tell us by this time they were in fear of their lives because of this storm. Matthew also tells us they've been blown far away from the shore. And that was, a, that was especially frightening for those men at sea in that day because they didn't have GPS. They didn't even have compasses or, or any of these tools that people use at sea to determine where they are. So when they got blown away from the, the sea, uh, blown away from the coast, and they couldn't see the land anymore, they really didn't have any idea where they were. So they were afraid. They were afraid not only of drowning, but just because they were lost. Then, John tells us in verse 19, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. Another miracle is happening here. They see Jesus walking on the water. That's amazing to me. Most of us have a hard time swimming in water. Now, I don't think any of us can walk in it. Jesus is walking on the water and they're afraid. Why are they afraid? Well, Mark tells us uh, they thought he was a ghost, that he was some kind of a spirit. They didn't understand. But Jesus speaks to them. Jesus speaks to them, tells them in verse 20, he said to them, it is odd, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. So another miracle is going on here. Jesus is walking on the water. And Matthew adds to the story. Matthew 14, verse 28, Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water uh, to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you little babe, why did you doubt? So momentarily, Peter got out of the boat and he began to walk on the water. And then he saw the storm going on around him and he got afraid. He lost his faith. His faith, his weak faith no longer supported him. And he began to sink. And he cried out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And Jesus did what Jesus does best. He reached out and he saved him, pulled him out of the water. Matthew says in verse 32, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Again, Jesus' presence calms the storm. That verse also says, those who were in the boat came and worshipped him. Don't overlook those words that are important. Those disciples in the boat worship Jesus. They worship Jesus, and I tell you, that's one of the greatest signs of a true disciple. False disciples don't do that. They don't worship Jesus. True disciples worship Jesus. Jesus. 
verse 21 says, Then they willingly received him into the boat. So Jesus, he climbs into the boat with his, his disciples. Now understand, these disciples, the ones in that boat, they had literally, and I guess there's a pun intended here, but they literally just uh, experienced a boatload of miracles. They saw Jesus doing the healing. They saw Jesus feeding the 5,000 plus. They experienced a miracle and the fact that they had survived this storm that they were in. They saw Jesus walking on the water. They saw Peter walking on the water. They saw Peter sinking and they saw Jesus reaching down and pulling Peter out of the water. Now it's one thing to walk on water. Can you imagine having enough support to reach down and pull somebody else out? So that's a miracle within itself. They witnessed the storm being calmed. And so there's a, a, a series of miracles going on here that's just mind-blowing. That series of miracles has a, an effect. An effect on these disciples in the boat. Matthew says that they were saying, Truly you are the Son of God. He goes on to say that those who were in the boat, in verse 33... It came and worshipped him. And again, I'll tell you, that's a true sign of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. They willingly worship Jesus Christ. Now let's, let's consider the multitude. Let's consider the moment, for a moment the multitude of disciples that have been following Jesus. They too had experienced a, a series of miracles. They'd seen Jesus healing the lame. They had seen him making blind men see, and deaf men hear, and lame men walk, and, and, and casting out demons, and, and, and healing epileptics, and paralytics, and all of these things. And then they had been there and received the food when Jesus uh, created food, and he fed the 5,000, and, and they experienced all of these things. They saw the miracles. They have been a part of the miracles, received the miracles. But let me ask you a question. Does anything in here say they ever worshipped Him? They did. They just kept following Him because they wanted more food. So there's a huge difference here in these two groups of disciples. Those in the boat worshipped Him and the multitude of disciples didn't. I want you to think about those twelve that were in the boat for just a minute. Down in verse 70, Jesus answered them and said, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is the devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So even one of those twelve that Jesus called to be his apostles, even one of them was a false disciple, a false believer. Judas Iscariot, the very one who had betrayed Jesus and turned him over to be crucified. Let's pick up in verse 22. To hear Jesus and his disciples are, they've reached Capernaum. They've reached their Capernaum, and I, I skipped the verse. I want to back, back up. How did they get there? Well, yet another miracle occurred. Another miracle that happened here. We see it back in uh, um, verse 21. Immediately the boat was at the land where they had been going. Here they were, they were out at sea, far from the shore. Jesus gets in the boat and all of a sudden they're transported across miles of ocean, miles of sea. It's actually a lake, fresh water, it's not an ocean, but they were transported to Capernaum, the very place that they were trying to get to. So yet another miracle has happened. And here they are, they're in Capernaum, they're, they're there, they made it to where they were going. What about the multitude? Well, where were they? Well, John tells us in verse 22, On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there, except that one which the disciples had entered, and Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but the disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people saw, therefore, that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeing Jesus. So here these, this multitude is. They're still in the same place where Jesus had miraculously fed them, still in that deserted place on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is also Tiberias. 
the day, they were still there, they were waiting. Why? Because they saw there was only one boat there. Only one boat on the shore. Remember, Jesus and his disciples had crossed the Sea of Galilee in the boat. But all of this multitude had walked around the, uh, uh, the shore of the Sea of Galilee and met them when they came to this deserted place. So there was only one boat there. And they witnessed Jesus' disciples, the twelve, getting into that boat and leaving to go to Capernaum. But they also noticed Jesus wasn't with them. So they assumed that Jesus was still on the same side of the Sea of Galilee they were. They were waiting there. But the next morning they wake up and Jesus can't be found. There's no other boat there and they're scratching their head thinking, well, where did he go? What happened to him? But they, they finally came to the conclusion he must have left. They had no idea that he had decided to take a little stroll across the water, that he walked across the sea. That didn't even enter into their mind, but they didn't know he wasn't there, they, that he left. They just didn't know how. So at that time, some other boats from Tiberias, from the sea, came to the shore, and they got in those boats, and they went to Capernaum because they knew Jesus. They knew that that was the place he probably most likely would be found. This multitude was still following Jesus. But we need to understand something here. The rationale, the reason, the motivation behind their following. These people in that culture and in that time, they lived for food. And rightly so, in a way. They didn't have modern conveniences. They didn't have grocery stores or food pantries they could depend on or, or food missions. They, 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 they depended upon... Uh, their daily life was a battle. A battle to achieve food. They didn't know where their next meal was coming from. So they were following after Jesus because they wanted more food. But understand that in their earthly terms, they, that food was a big issue with them. So they were following Jesus because they wanted Him to miraculously feed them again. Verse 25, When they found Him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? <laughs> Since they didn't see Jesus leave and had no idea that he walked on the water, they said, Lord, how on earth did you get here? When did this happen? We don't understand. And Jesus pretty much ignores their question. He ignores it. doesn't really answer it at all, but he does answer them. But his answer kind of leads me to believe that he was more concerned over why they were following him than their question. Jesus answered, verse 26, He answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. He said, I know why you're following me. You just want more to eat. That's all. Nothing more. And I want you to notice they called him rabbi. They called him teacher. Never called him Messiah. Never called him Christ. Never called him Savior. Never called him Lord. They called him Rabbi. See, they weren't interested in salvation. They weren't interested in the Word of God. They weren't interested in a Savior, a Messiah, a Christ. They were only interested in getting their bellies full. So Jesus says to them, don't do that. He says in verse 27, Do not labor for food which perishes, but for food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set His seal on Him. He says, don't do that. Don't, don't work for bread that perishes. Don't, don't work for what is temporary. Don't waste your, your efforts, your energy on things that are temporary. Instead, work for what is eternal. Use your resources for what is eternal. Stop working for food that perishes. Paul says that one day we'll all stand on before the judgment seat of Christ and when we do, the works that we've done, the works that we do will be laid on the foundation. We're building on the foundation of Christ. And he says when we, we do things that don't have eternal value, that's like laying wood and uh, stubble and hay on the foundation of Christ. And when the judgment fires come, all of that will be burned away. He says there are works that aren't sinful, but don't really have any eternal value. And the better thing to do is be working for works that, that are building gold and, and, and valuable stones on the foundation. 
things don't work for temporary things, work for eternal things that have eternal value. He says, work for food that gives eternal life. What is that? Well, Jesus answers that question down in verse 35. Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He says, don't labor for bread that perishes. Instead, labor for bread that gives life, eternal life. Who is that? Jesus says, I am that bread. I am that life. We should be laboring for eternal life, our own eternal life, and the eternal life of others. That is the work of God. Those are the works that we are to do. Salvation for the lost. Those things are eternal. Don't work for food that perishes. Instead, work toward bread of life. I'm going to end there this morning. We're going to get into these things a little deeper next Sunday as Jesus continues to tell us more about what it means to Him to be, for Him to be the bread of life. There's a lot more in this chapter for us to cover. Let's stand and turn to 324. 324.
teaching that you give us through this sixth chapter of God's gospel. Lord, we ask you to speak to our hearts and let us, uh, let's be sure that uh, we are true Christians, true disciples of Jesus Christ, Lord. We're, we're here to worship. We're here to worship, and I, I truly believe in my heart that I stand before true believers this morning. I don't sense that you're leading me to, uh, to speak to any individual here because I don't believe there are false disciples here, but Lord, only you know. I don't. But Lord, if there be a false disciple among us, Lord, I pray that you'll uh, speak into their heart today, Lord, and that you'll uh, draw them out of that uh, deception. Lord, that they'll uh, come to saving faith. Maybe there'll be somebody online that hears this message, Lord, that, uh, uh, that needs to hear this. Lord, I, I pray that uh, that false disciples will be turned. Lord, that uh, that, uh, that uh, hard ground will be broken up. Lord, that it'll be uh, uh, stern, Lord, that you'll uh, lead them down that, uh, uh, that difficult road that leads to that narrow gate, Lord, that they will step through and be safe. Lord, you know that I've had a, a calling on my heart for a long time now to reach those that are deceived. Lord, also within this message we hear about uh, food that perishes, Lord, and let us be working toward uh, eternal things and not temporal things of this world. Lord, being guilty of that myself, confess the last few weeks of uh, being uh, uh, too involved in worldly things and not involved enough in, uh, in eternal things. And Lord, I, I pray you'll forgive me for that because I've been distracted. Lord, I, I feel like you're taking that distraction away from me now, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that if anyone else in this uh, congregation that feels that same uh, same concern, Lord, that they'll offer up that same prayer. Lord, let us, let us work toward what's eternal. Lord, what's in this world is so temporary. We get distracted by politics and by the culture and by uh, just so many different things. Lord, remove those distractions. Let's focus on you. And the importance of what it means to uh, to reach the lost in this world, because time is short. Lord, watch over us, lead us, and guide us in the coming weeks, and let us uh, let us worship you well. Let us uh, honor and glorify you in how we live our lives, and let the evidence of Christ be seen in us. The greatest testimony that we have is how we live our lives, and let us live it well. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.